Yeah, book by book. And I'm Richard Buse, sitting here in All Souls Church, Langham Place in London, England, and we're going to embark upon a very exciting study in John's Gospel, chapters 2 and 3. This is the second uh, session in our series of studies on this. And I'm joined by Paul Blackham, Dr. Paul Blackham, and also by our international guest, Anne Graham Lotz. And we're thrilled that you're here in London, England at the present time, Anne. And as we look at this uh, book now of John's Gospel, chapters 2 and 3, why don't I take a little reading, first of all, as we share together. I'll start off, I think, at the end... I'll start off, I think, at the end of chapter 2, verse 23. Now, while Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. He did not need man's testimony about man, for he knew what was in a man. Then chapter 3, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night. And it's quite dramatic. So first of all, we see we're thinking about the miraculous signs and the first of the miraculous signs that Jesus did was, of course, at the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee that took place there. I mean, I've done a few weddings in my time. You've done a few weddings. We've all been at weddings. And often things go wrong. We've seen, I've seen uh, the bride in tears. I once saw the photographer crash into the wedding cake. The whole thing went spinning. <laughs> People running around pulling up little pillars and trying to assemble, reassemble the wreckage. Well, here's something went wrong uh, in this particular feast. But let's first of all look at it. It took place on the third day, it says. On the third day, a wedding took place. The third day after what? Is this just a trivial piece of nothing? Well, it, it, John is such a deep um, writer that he often includes things which you could just go over, but he, he, they're, they're deeply meaningful. Because it's not just the third day since all the events that happened, because he's only just got all his disciples together, mm -hmm. and now they've been all, all of them invited to this wedding. So it looks as if there's an awful lot happened in three days. More likely... And the third day has a significance in John's Gospel because throughout Scripture, all the way through the Old Testament, the third day is all about resurrection, mm -hmm. which is why in the Scriptures to be... Uh, Jesus was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. It was prophesied this way. So that uh, sometimes, John, we'll see it a few times in, in the Gospel. He'll introduce something as happening after two days or on the third day or three days and things like that because he's giving us a little clue as to the significance of what we're reading. Mm. He's saying that if you're an Old Testament scholar, and he, he, he is, mm. um, he's saying there's a clue for you to help you understand the significance of what you're about to read. So it's really making us think, if we were reading in that way, we go, oh, something's going to happen now that's about new life, about resurrection, about new beginnings, something like that. It's a little clue for us. It's not trivial. No, it's dramatic. Mm. And it's very important for us to understand that. So, Anne, as I look at now this uh, bit about the water being turned into wine, many of us know this story. Uh, what is the significance about water being turned into wine? Any significance? Well, one of the most significant things is that it was an act of creation, wasn't mm. it? That the water, I mean, water is water. It just doesn't become wine. <laughs> you could leave it around for a long time. It would never become wine. And so when he created... Uh, wine out of the water, it, it was an act of creation. He wasn't turning it into something. That was just something brand new he was bringing into existence. But I think the application of this is also very significant. You know, and it's one of the sweetest things to think that on the third day and, and you know, as he's introducing this passage and giving it such emphasis that this was really the start of the public ministry of mm -hmm. Jesus and the very first miracle he ever did, and it was in a home. Mm -hmm. And specifically, it was within the context of a marriage. And in this marriage, if we think of wine as being uh, sort of tasty and full of life or mm. whatever, and water as being somewhat flat and ordinary, maybe it, the application would be that there's sometimes a marriage or a home where the wine has run out or the love has run out or the tastiness has run out. And, and sometimes it happens from the very beginning. I've talked to young couples, and I'm sure you all have too, but almost the moment they said their wedding vows, the marriage has been in trouble. Mm -hmm. And they've had no real love for each other and no sense of purpose together as a couple. And, and their marriage is just flat. It's almost so like they've done... The, you mean the complaint might be sometimes, they have no love, yes. you know, and yeah. that can happen. That's right. And, but the 
thrill of this is that when the, the wine ran out and there was no more wine, then they went and told Jesus. You know, they didn't tell him what to do about it. They just stated the problem that there's no more wine. And then his mother told the servants, whatever he says, do, yeah. which is really just bringing him into the situation and making him Lord so that anything he tells you to do, you do. And as a result, of course, the water was turned into wine and it was better than it was in the beginning. And just, uh, just a little brief word of personal testimony that's happened to me. I mean, the love ran out in my marriage. And, uh, and it's a very frightening thing because if you've said your vows for life, mm. then you feel that you're stuck in a loveless marriage and you feel trapped. And I just turned it over to Jesus and whatever he told me to do, I did. And one of the first things he told me was to not concentrate on my relationship with my husband, but concentrate on my relationship with God and let him fill my life. What a marvelous and as, thing. Yeah, and as he does, then God is love and through me he can love my husband. And I promise you, he didn't restore the old love I had for my husband. He gave me a brand new love for my husband and just took our marriage and made something new and fresh out of it. So this fall we will have been married 37 years. and. Um, and the love we have for each other now is much better and more wonderful than it was at the beginning. But we had to surrender it completely to Jesus, do whatever he told us to do, and then it's, an, it's a miracle. It's just an act of creation, and not all at once, but um, in our lives, where he just took our marriage and gave us something better than what we'd had before. And I think one of the promises in this passage is that he can take that which is ordinary and flat, and there's no human remedy, and he can invade that situation and, um, and produce a miracle. And it was a quiet miracle, nothing flashy. In yeah. fact, there's a precious phrase that says, only the servants knew, mm -hmm. because they were the ones that put the water in and they saw the wine come out. The people in the, the wedding feast never knew what the miracle was. And I think people could look at, at my marriage and they would never know what God has done in private. But my husband and I know that, you know, the water went in and we did the best we could. It wasn't good enough. But the Lord Jesus brought the wine out and made something very wonderful out of it. Oh, and it's just, it must be such a boost to millions of people just to hear you say that testimony for us all. I think it's wonderful. And what you're basically saying is that in any situation, you know, Jesus can take hold of the ordinary. The ordinary can become better and the best is yet to come. That seems to be a part especially of especially within message. a marriage and a home and a yeah. family. I think that's just first in his heart. It's just mm -hmm. no accident that he begins his miracles here in a home, giving it that kind of a spotlight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Then as we move on from the wedding feast, we're coming on to verse 12 of Jesus, do you see it there? Driving out the businessmen from the temple. It looks, Paul Black, I mean, as though Jesus has just lost his temper. Um, actually, what are we to learn from this incident? Why was the Lord very, I think the right word is really passionate. Why was he so passionate about this? Again, John gives us some little clues. Verse 13, almost time for the Jewish Passover. He's in Jerusalem, temple courts, very busy, coming up to Passover. Now, Passover, if this is the festival that Jesus cares most about because this is when he will die at the time of Passover. The whole point of the Passover festival was to look forward to the death of the Lamb of God, the Messiah. So he, he's at Jerusalem, perhaps hoping Israel, are they thinking spiritually about this with understanding, longing for the reality of these things? Not at all. He goes to the temple, the temple, and, and of course they know zeal for the Lord's house has consumed him. He's so passionate about the temple, so passionate about the temple because of all the significance of it. It's a huge lesson in spiritual truth, particularly at the time of Passover. He goes in, and what does he find? Um, just commerce, business. And commerce is particularly bad at this time because, you know, it's about free grace, the free gift of forgiveness and new life. And the very first thing that would impact someone, say uh, the nations, the Gentiles, say they're coming to, they want to come and find the truth. The first thing that would impact them is, it costs you. Have you got money? Because you're going to need money if you're going to get anywhere here. So he's so, it's, the whole thing's a denial of reality from start to finish. And he won't have it. He won't have it. So he drives them out. And, you know, and that in itself is a, is a miracle because just one man against this you know, enormous uh, activity that's going on. And it's the very passion of him. And that his authority, that it's his house. It's he not the their house. He's the governor. Mm. So he pushes them all out. And, of course, that uh, provokes deep theological reflection. And he prophesies his own resurrection in the light of it. 
But that's what's going on. It's much deeper than just... Um, and, a, a tr and again, it's not a trivial incident. It's a no, tremendously no. significant comment on who he is. Everything is filled with importance. Mm -hmm. Every, so we had the wedding at Cana, now in Jerusalem. And then this man comes to him, yeah. chapter 3. Yeah. Uh, Nicodemus, one of the ruling body of the Jews. He comes to see him at night. He's obviously... There's something about this story, again, that is full of significance, friends. And why do you think that Nicodemus, then, this high-powered teacher of the law, came to Jesus? And do you think also that he expected the kind of reply that Jesus gave to him? <laughs> I don't think he expected that reply at all. And I think he expected Jesus to be somewhat impressed with him, you know, because he was the leading teacher of the law in Israel. His name would have been a household word amongst the families and the people who studied the law. And he was very well known, very self-assured. And I think he was coming, maybe in his heart searching, but because he was a learner, he was a teacher, but he also wanted to know, know as much as he could. He was seeking extra information. Maybe Jesus could just sort of enrich his understanding of truth. And so he comes and asks some question about heaven. And Jesus, basically, he doesn't play those kind of games. You, know, you would think Jesus would have you know, said, Nicodemus, thank you. I feel so honored that a man of your stature would come visit me. <laughs> Instead, Jesus just looks right at him and says, Nicodemus, you'll never even see heaven, much less enter it unless you're born again. And I think it was astounding to Nicodemus. And he didn't understand at all. He said, you mean I have to crawl back in my mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus said he was speaking spiritually, that he would have to totally be born again, that nothing in Nicodemus says, as brilliant as he was, as religious as he was, nothing in Nicodemus would make him acceptable by God. And, and that's incredible. When we think today, uh, in this country, in my country of America, so many people are churched and so many people are religious, and that does not get us to heaven. Jesus says you won't even see heaven. It doesn't matter how many rituals, how many baptisms, how many communions, how many things you go through as far as being a part of a church or a religious group. That won't make you acceptable to God. You must be born again. You must have a, a new life. And speaking of this new life that John is uh, emphasizing in his gospel, there has to be a work of the Spirit in your heart. And it's when we confess our sin and we tell God we're sorry, we claim Jesus as our Savior, invite him to come into our lives, he comes in and gives us a brand new life. Paul tells us in Corinthians that we become new creations. And it's that new creation that's accepted by God. And it's the new creation that goes to heaven. And, uh, and so when he told Nicodemus he had to be born again, that little phrase, of course, has become very common today. Well, and of course, your father, Billy Graham, has yeah. written a book called How to Be Born Again. That's, that's gone all over the world. Yeah. Well, and sometimes they even use it in commerce, you know, when an uh, old again model car, car. Com yeah, <laughs> comes back. <laughs> we, we but, the, but the idea is that uh, you, you must start over and start afresh. And the, the wonderful news of this is that regardless of the mess you've made in your life, regardless of the difficulties, you, you can start over. You can start brand new. You can have a fresh start. You can be born again and have a new mind, new will, new emotions uh, that's acceptable to God when you come to Him through faith in Jesus Christ. That's well, desperately important, desperately important for all of us who are shining in this study. Paul, I want to ask again about, from you about Nicodemus and, you know, what does Jesus teach Nicodemus here about how he should have understood the law because it, and the Old Testament because it appears that Nicodemus hadn't quite got it right. Well, that's, that's what I like when Anne was saying about he's the big shot the, and he knows. He's, he's, everyone thinks, oh, well, Nicodemus must know the everything. And then Jesus really is, seems almost surprised at how little he does know. So Jesus really, when he tells him these things, he's, he's using the language of the Old Testament and he says, have you not read Ezekiel? Have you not read Jeremiah? Have you not read Moses? He's constantly giving him allusions to scriptural passages. And Nicodemus, who th is supposed to know it all, is out of his depth. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't know about Ezekiel 36 and those other passages that talk about being inwardly washed and cleansed and so forth. He, I suppose he'd gone for the big sort of, you know, the big kingdom passages <laughs> about, you know, the Messiah, the ruler will come in and then we'll all be set. So he missed it. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. What does John the Baptist teach us here at the end of chapter 3, Anne, about the identity of Jesus? We're still looking at this identity thing. 
Well, you know, the contrast, really, between him and Nicodemus is mm. remarkable, isn't it? Because Nicodemus, I think, came to Jesus. Of course, he came by night because I think he didn't want anybody to see him talking to Jesus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there was a pride issue. And you see in John the Baptist the opposite, just such beautiful humility. And as you pointed out in our session before, John the Baptist, Jesus said there was no one who was born of women any greater than John the Baptist. So of all the Old Testament prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, he would have been as great as any of the Old Testament prophets. And yet he was totally eclipsed by the one that he was preparing the way for. And it would take such humility to build up your ministry, build up a big following, have people talking about you, and then back out of the way and give everything you've built up to Jesus. And so he says in this passage that he must increase, that I might decrease. And he says that he's the son of God. He's the one that he came to prepare the way for. And, and to see John's humility, to just totally step back and let everybody go to Jesus. And actually, you know, it's what we're to do. And I look at our world today, and sometimes within the Christian church, we build, um, we give celebrity status to people who write books or preach in pulpits or on radio or mm -hmm. TV, and, and almost they eclipse the one that they're supposed to be mm -hmm. exalting. And I think John the Baptist gives us a beautiful example of someone who kept his focus on God's call in his life. He was called to be a forerunner. He was called to prepare the way for Jesus, and he never lost his focus and totally was fulfilled as he exalted Jesus so that other people were drawn to Jesus. And I feel that's really what we're commanded to do, that whatever God has given us, whatever gifts, whatever position of service, our whole position is that we would decrease, he would increase, that people would look at us and what we're doing and see the exaltation of Jesus and that they would be drawn to Jesus through whatever we're doing. So John the Baptist sees to it that Jesus is surging to the fore steadily, unequivocally, which is what we want to do. Hey, but what about a little memory verse to take to bed with you tonight? John 3, 16? I don't know which version we might learn it in, but God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, I gave that once to a man on his, on his deathbed. I said, put your name in there. God so loved Ken, that as Ken believes in him, Ken should not die, but Ken should have eternal life. And I said to him, can you say that? He was almost dead, actually, but he took, a, he took a ballpoint and said, show me in the gospel. I showed him, there it is. And then he put a little tick in the margin, like that. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, you came to help me. I've done that, I believe. I close with the offer. Well, we could do that too, right now. God bless you, and thank you for sharing in this study. Thank you both very much.